Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to continue our journey watching Nicole and Azan on 90 Day Fiance. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor, and I'm going to react while I watch this show. Let's see if anything of interest comes out of my face. It would be nice to know what happened to all the money. You know, where did it go? Nicole put on this business around $6,000, and I put like 500 You know, I'd like to see that it's, that it's for real. Mom, there is a shop. It is happening. So then how's the shop going? It's going. It's a shop. Even though I told my mom that we were talking about opening a store, we never winded up going through with it. So there is no store. There is no store. Wow. There is no store. That's interesting. Well, I think a lot of us thought that was true, right? At least me and my wife thought that was true when we were watching that at the end of last season. It seemed really shady, right? There was this money that was invested. The mom was like, let's go see the shop. And he's like, oh, we can't go see it. And well, we can just go look at the outside, can't we? No, we can't go look at the outside. And it, it looked fishy. But I was willing to wait and see. Well, you know, well, who knows? Maybe there's a story there that was understandable. Now we're hearing there is no store. So either she, Nicole, knew that at the time and was lying, or Azan knew that at the time and was lying for the two of them. Let's hear the rest of the story here. We are still talking about having her in a school. Like, he, there are American schools, like, not American, but um, foreigner schools. Which is going to cost money. So what's the plan for that? I mean, do you, do you guys have an idea of how you're going to pay for it? Yes, yes. This is concerning. As you can tell from the way this conversation is going, Nicole and Azan haven't really thought about or they don't have firm plans for May's education. Up until this point, I've been giving Nicole the benefit of the doubt because we haven't seen the full picture. We don't know all the behind the scenes stuff when it comes to parenting. This is a pretty discreet thing that parents need to figure out. And it's not the end of the world if a kid doesn't go to kindergarten right away, but it does indicate a broader problem. If as a parent, you are neglecting the process of setting your kid up for school and at least on top of things well in advance. I mean, there are people that know uh, where their kid's gonna go to kindergarten years in advance. Not because you need to necessarily do that. Like I said, you know, say you miss the first couple months of kindergarten. It's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you can adjust. It's not like the kid's gonna be a flunky and a drug addict and homeless because they didn't go to the first couple months of kindergarten. So that's not the issue. What the issue is, is it's the tip of the iceberg and what is underneath the water. What other things are, is Nicole neglecting? What other things is Nicole just pushing off and postponing? What other things is Nicole just thinking, well, someone else will figure it out for me. It seems to be what she's doing right now. And we have been talking about, that. I have been talking about this for a long time, that an easy, linear way, simplistic way, is to look at Nicole and say, you are irresponsible. What is wrong with you? You are a baby. You are a immature child. Another way of looking at it is, let's, let's zoom out. Look at the broader picture. How did Nicole develop that behavioral trait and those, those set of behaviors, that pattern? Well, we clearly say, see a lot of people in Nicole's family, including her younger brother, being over-functioning for her, meaning that they put her down, they make her feel incompetent, they flat out just tell her that she doesn't know what she's doing. And, and when you have a dynamic like that, that's sustained since you're born, by the way, then your behavior and your personality is fixed within that system. And we don't exist in isolation. And that's one of the things that marriage and family therapists, couple and family therapists specialize in. We specialize in understanding the system. If you just try to understand Nicole in isolation, you're like, what's wrong with her? But when you see the family dynamic and you see how historically it's developed, maybe even you go back to grandparents and how they treated the mom and how that developed into her personality. Maybe the mom had a very irresponsible parent that she had to grow up very fast for and take care of. And so Nicole's mom, Robbie Lee, is 
very on top of things because she always had to be since she was at the age of eight or whatever. I don't know. But there are usually patterns that get passed down through the generations, the great grandparents and beyond. There's these patterns that all come down. And when you look at the big picture, Nicole is just one element in a system that all fits together quite nicely. Now, that doesn't mean that we just say, well, Nicole is off the hook. She's not responsible for her parenting responsibilities to provide education for May. No, but it does provide a bigger picture so that we can address the bigger picture and actually fix the problem. If we just yell at Nicole and say, you need to be more responsible. People have been doing that to her since she was born, I'm guessing. That's not going to work. It hasn't worked. What's going to work is if everyone works together to shift the dynamic, to shift the dynamic from I'm going to tell Nicole what to do and Nicole is going to fail all the time. And they both do that at the same time. Nicole's like failing and, and self-destructing and sabotaging herself. And then other people are coming in to save her and judge her and tell her that she's stupid. That's the way that dynamic goes. So a systems th therapist comes in and says, let's all shift this. Mom, let's not step in for her and save her. Mom, let's not put her down. Let's support her and be nice to her. Uh, you know, Nicole, let's believe in yourself. Let's do things on your own. Let's figure out if you want people to stop putting you down, then part of the deal is you have to rise to the occasion and be more responsible. And usually when we make those shifts, the Nicoles of the world step into that because people want to be competent. They don't want to be dependent. They want to be capable. They want to do things on their own. They don't want to self-sabotage. But when you are in a rigid system, things usually stay in a pattern. And fast forward 20, 30 years, and Nicole will still be irresponsible. Her life will be a train wreck. Everyone in the family will still be overfunctioning and putting her down, or she'll marry someone who overfunctions for her or whatever. Or May, her child, will overfunction for Nicole. And then May goes on to have children of her own that are like Nicole, that she overfunctions for, and the pattern just goes round and round and round family systems thinkers, we zoom out and we're like, okay, let's break the chain here. Let's actually change everyone such that the generations don't continue this sort of thing. Now, I don't know. It's always just been a hypothesis from the beginning, but it's been backed up by a lot of data thus far. A lot of people in the comments will say, I totally agree with Rob Lee that Nicole is irresponsible. She's not being a good mother. And yes, you could, you could absolutely make a case of that, especially with something like this. Nicole's like, well, I don't really know what we're going to do with May's kindergarten. What? <laughs> well, we're thinking about having her go to kindergarten in Morocco. Okay, where? Are you going to move to Morocco? Oh, that's news. I didn't know that was happening. Is Azan looking at, do you have the school picked out? Do you know the teachers? Do you know what's going to work for May? Do you know that May is going to thrive in that kind of situation? What's happening, <laughs> right? Now, anyone with half a mind would look at Nicole and be like, uh, you're not inspiring confidence. And it's one thing to ruin your own life. It's another thing to ruin May's life. This is the beginning of May's education. What's wrong with you, Nicole? Okay, so totally fine. But again, when you zoom out, if we're going to help Nicole and we're going to help May, then we have to help Nicole feel less dependent and more confident and more competent. And in order to do that, she needs to start to grow up. This I've said this from the beginning. When a child is 12... They are not competent at being an adult yet, right? A 12-year-old doesn't know how to pay their bills usually. They don't know how to plan a budget. They don't know how to get a career. They don't know how to perhaps even order things at a restaurant. <laughs> they, they don't know much because they're, they're a kid. They're 12. But at 22, we would hope that they're able to pay their bills, get a job, budget, socialize on their own. They're able to make plans. They're able to clean their bedroom. They're able to take a shower every day. They're able to organize their lives. Okay, so from 12 to 22, there's there are little changes that happen from there to there, right? So in order to have that happen at each stage, age appropriateness, there needs to be a dynamic, a pattern in the family that facilitates the child taking a little bit of risk maybe making a mistake, extending themselves and returning back to the baseline, returning back to mom and saying, I can't do this. And then the mom says something like, well, let me help you, but you can do this 12 year old activity. Like maybe it's doing your own laundry or maybe it's some chore around the house 
Or maybe it's, here's $50, you go to the mall and buy your own school supplies. I don't know. There's a lot of different versions of this. And through those tiny little interactions, each time there's a very important negotiation that is happening. The child does not feel confident to go to the mall and buy their own school supplies. They want their mom or dad or someone to be there with them, usually, uh, in a sort of an average situation. And so they might even say, well, I don't know what to buy. And the parent says, I believe in you. And if you make a mistake, we'll deal with it. So the parent is giving a very clear message. I believe in you. And if you make a mistake, that's okay. The kid goes to the mall. They're like looking at everything. They don't really know what to do. They buy their school supplies. They go home. And the parents are like, what'd you get? And the, the kid's like, well, I bought this and this and this. And the parents are looking at it and they're like, she didn't even buy pens. Why, you know, she, she forgot to buy pens. But the parent is thinking, but I want to facilitate that eventually at 22, the child is able to do things on their own. Right now, they didn't buy pens. That's a mistake they made. But I have my eye on development. I'm trying to build something here. I'm trying to build an independent creature. And you cannot build an independent creature overnight. And so I will look at her and I will say, wow, you did really good. And the kid is like, oh. I did really good. And then uh, the next day, you're like, hey, let's do a total inventory. Uh, okay, do you have paper? Yeah, I have paper. Did you buy your trapper keeper? Yeah, I bought my trapper keeper. Did you buy a backpack? Yeah, I got my backpack. Did you buy pens? Oh no, I didn't buy pens. That's okay. I have some pens right here for you. <laughs> so you can't, you know, it's like, it's all right. It's not a big deal. You didn't buy, buy but you don't go, you don't jump on the kid. You didn't buy pens. What's wrong with you? Okay. Because again, you have your eye on trying to build an independent creature. I don't think Nicole's family did that with her. So to expect her at her age right now to just suddenly have independence and confidence and the thought processes necessary to make choices, particularly to raise her own child, is asking a lot. And just to yell at her in the same way that if you just yell at the 12-year-old, you didn't get pens, what's wrong with you? Ah, you know, it's like... You have to cultivate that and to blame Nicole right now for not having those skills and not having that thought process is potentially misguided when we zoom out. Now, people will say, what, you're just going to blame the parents for Nicole's irresponsible behavior? No, because we want to zoom out from the parents as well. The parents grew up in a situation. The parents created a monster that they didn't, you know, now they have to take over because now there's a child involved. And so it gets real weird. And the beauty of systems thinking is no one is to blame. And we can all work together to move into the future. We can all recognize the reality and the patterns. We can all recognize that Nicole doesn't have the skills, doesn't have the thought processes. Systems thinkers are just like, yeah, let's not worry about who's to blame. Let's not yell at anyone. Let's just figure out how to do this. We need to help Nicole develop competence and confidence. How are we as a system going to do that for her? We don't want to yell at her and tell her what to do because that actually just compounds her notion that she doesn't know what she's doing. How are we going to build her up? How are we going to do that? That's what we would do. Now, I'm not saying that would work overnight. It might be another 10 years before Nicole catches up to an adult way of thinking because she wasn't given that opportunity or didn't take advantage of that opportunity or something. Something went wrong in all the steps prior to this moment that would have developed a sense of responsibility and a sense of practical knowledge and common sense about how to do things. You know, most parents with their kids uh, who have been raised well enough, you know, very, you know, through very iterative examples with parents, cultivating that confidence in the child over time, they get their license and they get an offender bender. And you don't jump down their throats. You're like, okay, well, it happens sometimes. Let's see what we can learn from that. You bumped into a car. Uh, I'm disappointed. Let's figure out a way you can pay it off. You're, it's okay, though. I still love you. I got in a little fender bender when I was young. What can we learn from this? Very small little things that happen over time. And how are we going to do that for her? That's, that's the point. Anyway, I'm rambling. Let's get back to the show. You have to go to kindergarten. She is way too smart to let her slip through the cracks. No. I think I should talk to Asden and see what would be best. I would think that you would already talk to Asden about this. Do you think you'll have a conversation with him tonight? 
Yeah, I'll probably call him later on. Last two nights, he's been really tired, so we haven't talked the last two nights. Really tired? What's he doing? Is he working? Uh, not right now. Really? How's the store going, Nicole? <laughs> this stepdad is extremely predictable. The, the stepdad, I get his feelings. I totally understand. If I were to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be like, dude, I get it. You're worried about me. You're worried about your stepdaughter. You don't think this is going to work. You know, I get it. Tell me about your feelings. How are you feeling? Let's get to that, you know, fundamental level. And feel free to express that. And what I'd wish that he would do in this moment is he'd say, Nicole, I am so afraid of what you're saying. And sometimes probably you will do this. Right now, I'm so afraid of what you're saying to me. You don't know where she's going to kindergarten. You and Azan, I feel, it seems to me like a terrible relationship. He seems like he's scamming you. He hasn't had a job. He's a grown man. Why doesn't he have a job? And he's tired all the time from what? What does he do all day? So with all those things, it makes me afraid. You are free to live your life. You are an adult and I love you. But when I see this, it terrifies me for you. It terrifies me for my granddaughter. I just have to get that off my chest. That would be a differentiated adult-like thing to say, but the stepdad, at least to the camera, never says anything like that. Let's rewatch this. Yeah, I'll probably call him later on. Last two nights, he's been really tired, so we haven't talked the last two nights. Really tired? What's he doing? Is he working? Uh, not right now. Really? How's the store going, Nicole? None of your business. Nicole and Aza never got married because they decided that they were going to start a business with all the money for the wedding instead of, you know, getting married. But Nicole doesn't talk about it. So another systemic reality that I see through my systemic lens when I see the three of them is that when Rob Ali and Nicole are alone, Rob Ali takes on sometimes the overfunctioning role and the judgmental role of Nicole. But when the three of them are together, stepdad, mom, and Nicole, the stepdad always presents the critical, loud, judgmental voice that frees up Rob Ali to be more of the reasonable one, the one who can actually be a little bit closer to Nicole and try to be on her side, kind of. And so that's how these three people fit together well. Each person provides a role. Someone in the system has to yell at Nicole, so that'll be the stepdad. And the stepdad steps into that role, he volunteers for that. And the system elects him. It, that's how systems work, is that you volunteer, either consciously or unconsciously, and the system elects you. They say, this is your job, and that's usually subconscious. The mom, Rob Ali, is elected as the concerned questioner but also trying to have a connection with Nicole. You'll see the mom actually trying to reach out, but she has a lot of judgmental thoughts and a lot of criti criticism at the ready that she will express sometimes. Nicole, she's elected in the family. I believe that Nicole is the scapegoat. And again, I have no data on this other than the little bits that we've seen, but it wouldn't surprise me if I were to assess this whole family and hear their perspective that I wouldn't throw out and have them agree with this conceptualization that Nicole is elected by the family to be the scapegoat, meaning that she is the one that everyone is going to judge. She's going to be the one who will self-sabotage so that everyone can judge her. And the function that that provides the family is it brings everyone together to fight this thing called Nicole's problems. And that provides closeness. The other thing it does is it distracts everyone from whatever other problem or problems are happening in the family because this Nicole problem is so obvious and so absorbing that all the other problems you can ignore because you got to fix this one problem first. But the other problems might be much more ingrained and much more entrenched and much more scary to the family system as a whole. I don't know what that is because there's been no data along those lines, but I've seen that a lot. And I don't know, but I'd, I'd want to ask them about that. You are woefully unprepared. Mother, I've been with him for three years and I know how everything is going to be. We have a lot of plans for ourselves and for, you know, our future that are still going along. It's a little slow, but, you know, we will eventually figure things out. But right now, I don't want to put pressure on Azim. I am not going to be worrying about anything 
on my vacation to Grenada. Interesting. So I don't know if this is what she's saying, but it sounds possible that she's putting off her responsibilities to May because in order to figure out the May kindergarten issue, she has to figure out the Azan issue and her and Azan aren't very secure right now. And she, and she just said she doesn't want to put pressure on him. I'm guessing because she thinks she's going to lose him and she really doesn't want to do that. And so in a sense, she might be sacrificing the planning of kindergarten for May to try to relieve some pressure on Azan so that she doesn't lose him. Uh, that's unfortunate. You would think that if Azan and Nicole were serious about each other, that one, Nicole wouldn't worry about Azan leaving, and two, that the two of them would be very much on top of like, okay, kindergarten, what's the steps? What do we need to do? Let's go meet the teacher. Let's go figure everything out. So I don't know what's happening exactly, but uh, the family has every reason to be concerned. And Nicole is not inspiring confidence. Again, it's one thing for Nicole to put her own life at risk, her own future at risk. It's another thing to put May's life at risk and her future at risk. All right, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle in which I react to this show. Everyone out there, let me know what you think in the comments and please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.